Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well, and of course Arnie does too. Now I think that we can all agree that Florida is quite a strange place as it's famous for its people as well as its wildlife. And this small sticky out part of North America has a very unique climate as Florida's warm weather means that a lot of non-native species can live there. And as there are so many invasive species in Florida, I won't be able to get through all of them today, but I will be going through five invasive species in Florida. And we'll start off in Southeast Asia as we have the Burmese Python. Now the Burmese Python is one of the largest snakes in the world, reaching a maximum size of around five meters or 16 feet. And in its native Southeast Asia, it is a semi-aquatic species species, spending most of its time in water, where it preys on a large number of different animals, such as mammals, reptiles, and even birds. And if you were a prey item being attacked by a Burmese python, it's not a nice way to go, as Burmese pythons are constrictors and suffocate their prey before swallowing them whole. But how did this large python make its way to Florida? One of the ways they have spread is through the pet trade, as even though they're quite a demanding pet, many people enjoy keeping the Burmese python. And as they grow to such a large size, some people may not want their Burmese pythons anymore, and release them into the wild. Hurricane Andrew is thought to be another reason, as in 1992, this hurricane destroyed a python breeding facility and many snakes escaped into the wild. And today more than 1,300 Burmese python have been captured in the Everglades alone. But the risk of an attack from a Burmese python on a human is actually quite small, as most of the documented attacks are from people who keep Burmese pythons and have been bitten by their pets. And this isn't just a species that could potentially damage the Floridian ecosystem, because it already has. Because as I've covered they eat almost anything smaller than them, which has had disastrous consequences on the native species. And this is especially the case with mammals, as in places where Burmese pythons have become established, raccoon populations have dropped by 99%, possums by 98 and bobcats by 87 and mammals such as the marsh rabbits, cottontail rabbits and foxes have effectively disappeared. And this can have long lasting damaging effects, as these mammals play an important role in the ecosystem and also provide food for other predators. And in the Everglades there is already a predator that reigns supreme, as the Burmese pythons and American alligators have been fighting a long war ever since the Burmese python invaded. Because as most of the mammals are gone, they'll often prey on each other with differing outcomes. And to help combat this invasion, you can legally kill as many Burmese pythons as you like, and there are free training programs where you can learn to safely identify Burmese pythons and even capture and humanely kill them. So it's no wonder why this giant snake has caused such a problem. But for our next species, we'll head down to the freshwaters of South America, as we have the Oscar. Now the Oscar is one of the most popular fish in the aquarium trade as they're full of personality and are relatively hardy. And in the waters in which they're found, the ecosystem is very competitive as there are over 3,000 species of fish in the Amazon as well as many other predators. And as they reach a maximum size of around 45 centimeters or 18 inches, they find themselves in the middle of the food chain, normally feeding on plant matter, smaller fish and crustaceans. But today unfortunately they can be found over large parts of Florida and this is all down to their popularity in the aquarium trade as when unresponsible fish keepers don't want their Oscars anymore, they like to release them into the wild. And as Florida has such a tropical climate, it's a home away from home for the Oscars. But as they don't get too large, they don't prey on most native fish directly, but rather compete with them, as there are many other native fish that are in the same ecological niche as the Oscar. And this means that there's less food to go around for the native species, and they've also been known to take out large numbers of native invertebrates. But as there are much larger predators that would happily eat an Oscar, such as the introduced peacock bass, their numbers are mostly kept under control and hopefully they'll decrease in the future. But for our next species we'll move back down to South America as we have the black and white tegu. Now the black and white tegu is the largest of the tegu lizards, reaching a maximum size of around 4.5 feet or 1.4 meters. And in its native range it is an omnivorous opportunistic feeder, feeding on anything from crustaceans, spiders, fish, other lizards, snakes and small mammals, as well as plant-based foods such as fruits, seeds and nuts. And the story of the tegu becoming invasive in Florida is once again down to the pet trade, as the black and white tegu is one of the most intelligent lizards in the world and can even be housebroken. But as a healthy tegu can live to around 20 years old, it's definitely a pet that needs a lot of planning. And some irresponsible pet keepers that don't do their planning eventually release their tegu into the wild. And as they're so intelligent, and because they have such a large diet, this has had disastrous consequences for the ecosystem, as not only will this large lizard feed on small native animals, but it's also an infamous egg eater. And it doesn't just eat birds eggs, as it eats the eggs of its fellow 
yellow reptiles, as they have been documented consuming American alligator eggs, as well as tortoise eggs, American crocodile eggs, and even sea turtle eggs. And this can cause a dramatic decline in their numbers, which is made even worse by the fact that the tegus will compete with these species. So if you ever see a tegu in the wild, you should definitely report it, and this will hopefully help control their numbers. But for our next species, we'll head back down to South America, as we have the brown hoplo catfish. Now this species is pretty widespread throughout South America, and has mastered a wide range of habitats, including stagnant swamps, rainforest creeks, and clear water rivers. And it has a few adaptations to help it survive in this wide range of habitats, as they have the ability to breathe atmospheric oxygen, which means that they don't just have to rely on their gills to breathe. And the brown hoplo is also an armoured catfish, as it has strong plates running along its body, which protects it from some predators. And this catfish was first documented in Florida in 1995, but today it can be found throughout Central and South Florida. And again, one of the main reasons for this is the aquarium trade, as they're again kept as pets and released into the wild. But as this fish only reaches a maximum size of around 24 centimeters or 9.4 inches, it's not going to prey on any native fish directly, but instead it feeds on their eggs and also competes with them for food by feeding on plant matter and also small invertebrates. And as they're such an adaptable species, they can survive in almost any habitat as long as it isn't heavily polluted. And although in some areas they seem to have almost completely taken over, there are still plenty of Floridian predators that can feed on them, so hopefully their numbers can be kept under control. And this just goes down as another reminder of why you shouldn't release your pets into the wild. But for a final species, we'll move over to Australia, as we have the cane toad. Now some of you smart people out there may already know that the cane toad isn't native to Australia, but today it is estimated that there are over 190 million cane toads on the continent. And this is because the cane toad is the most famous example of an invasive species, as cane toads were introduced into Australia in 1935, with the intention to control the cane beetle in sugar cane fields. But this was a massive failure, as the cane toads and cane beetles rarely crossed paths. And instead, the cane toads fed on native animals, such as insects, small rodents, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and even bats. And most predators are ill-equipped to deal with the cane toads, as they have toxins which they excrete from glands behind their eyes, and this proves fatal to most predators. And although their invasion hasn't been quite as bad in the US, it still has caused quite a few problems, as they were introduced in the 1940s for the same reasons that they were introduced into Australia. And since then, they've been able to spread throughout many parts of Florida, and their toxic protection has come in very handy, as not only will a predator become very ill or even die after feeding on a cane toad, but it will also be in trouble if it tries to feed on its eggs, as their eggs contain a bufotoxin, which is almost as toxic as the poison in their glands. The cane toads seem to cause most damage in urban areas, as many curious pets will often eat these cane toads and fall very ill. And because of this, they're understandably very unpopular and has led many people to try and wipe them out. But if you decide to go hunting for cane toads, make sure it's not a native species as they look very similar. And make sure you don't touch their poisonous glands, as this poison can squirt out and even blind you if it gets into your eyes. So I think it's very easy to see why the cane toad is one of the most famous invasive species in the world. But that's about it for this video. I'm planning on doing these invasive species videos by location from now on. So if you have any country or region you'd like me to cover, then leave it down in the comments below, and I'm sure I'll get around to it very soon. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.